rather serious and solemn in a way. And I like to do at least two things. I like to talk, first of all, of what happens in divorce. One of the things which I found helpful in discussing with couples who are contemplating divorce is for them to try to visualize what happens should they divorce. So we want to look at some of those things that are true, I think, in every experience where persons go through divorce. Secondly, I'd like to talk for a little while also what I call running the red lights. There are no sudden moral failures. That is, there are certain warning signals along the line if we take the warning seriously. There are flashing red lights, there are yellow lights along the line that tell us that something's going awry. At a time when divorce and separation are rampant, also the statistics are alarming in many different ways. At a time when uh, approximately one out of two marriages will end in divorce or separation, of those uh, uh, who remarry again, approximately 65% of those who divorce will divorce a second time. If children are involved in that remarriage, a 75% of those who remarry will divorce a second time. Approximately one half of persons who get married today have been living together before marriage. And out of those, approximately 80% will separate and divorce later on. Now those, to me, are rather serious statistics. It's interesting also that in recent studies, we're learning that in surveys taken, those who have lived together before marriage are also the ones who seem to have less sex satisfaction after marriage than those who have sought to live a pure life. Today, we talk about uh, divorce for any cause, and it's come down almost to that. If people say they simply don't love each other any longer, it's reason enough for some to get divorced. Or, usually, it's attraction that is already going elsewhere. I say sometimes it's different than it was when I began my ministry. When I began my ministry, when you found out a couple was in trouble, you usually had, say, a six months or so to work with it. Today, by the time a pastor finds out that a couple's in trouble, they have already seen their lawyer. The past several decades also have been rather alarming in that counselors for some time had been saying that if it doesn't work out, okay, break up. If you don't love each other any longer, why, why stick it out? They were even saying that children are hurt in that kind of bad situation anyway, and they were told that children will get over it rather easily. I know counselors who've given exactly those terms that children will get over it pretty easily. They're very adaptable, flexible kind of thing. Today, there is a new wave coming that is very encouraging to me. Not that it's sweeping the country, but there are many counselors turning about their whole viewpoint, and some are admitting it today. That is what they used to say. But today they know that that isn't true. It isn't true that children ever get over it. There are people past middle age who are still suffering from back there when their parents separated. Children don't get over it, neither do persons who divorce and remarry get over it. I mean, there are scars, let's say, and sometimes open scars together. So many of these are refusing to believe. And while it's easy to get a divorce from legal grounds, yet the impact of that thing continues on. There are side effects, there are depression, there are all kinds of things like that. We're told that today's psychiatrists have the highest rate of divorce 
among health care caregivers. Pediatricians, I understand, have the lowest level of divorce among health caregivers. Today, however, I am happy that books and articles are beginning to appear which are reversing some of the trends that we've seen in the last while. Trends that say, well, divorce, children will easily get over it. I've found helpful to have couples contemplate divorce and think about what will happen should they go through a divorce. What will it be like after the divorce? When there is separation and divorce, it is never the concern of only two people. It is one of those things that's intergenerational and not only affects one generation, but affects more than one generation. So the ramifications of divorce, we must realize, are lifelong and far-reaching. So, first of all, I ask couples to imagine what happens to you and your spouse in the breaking of a fundamental human relationship. The second most important decision in life, we say, is the decision to marry. Next to our commitment to God himself is the commitment of a man and a woman to each other. And so the breaking of that fundamental relationship is that also which uh, leaves scars, to say the least, the rest of life. Many times it leaves very open wounds. Some time ago, I was lecturing to a group, and in my talk, I referred to divorce as sin. There was a bishop in that group who in the discussion period raised the question, John, did I hear you say that divorce is sin? I responded by asking, is it the breaking of a relationship? Is divorce the breaking of a primary relationship? He answered yes to both of those. Then I said I would understand that to be a sin. Number two, I ask couples at times who are contemplating divorce to imagine whether they will be happier or not as happy after the divorce. Interesting 10-year study here says that only approximately 10% of those who divorce and remarry say they are actually happier after that divorce and remarriage. I have had numerous persons come to me who have been divorced and remarried who tell me very, very strongly it would have been easier to build the first marriage or to rebuild it than to start all over again. Because why? We have a lot of investment into that first relationship. Many times, not only of our own lives, but with our children also. Number three, consider carefully the loneliness after divorce. I've had uh, people tell me that after divorce, life is worse than death. Because people don't die. They live. <laughs> they continue living. And it's like a living death, which they experience. And loneliness is that which is the key to our time. Uh, often causes persons to do devious things, to live in devious ways, efforts to find companionship which leads other than to other wrong relationships at times, searching for those who will care about them can also complicate uh, their relationships. And so we say, consider carefully the loneliness which follows divorce. Think of that ahead of time. Number four, imagine the loss of destroyed dreams. Every couple that gets married is loaded with dreams. You're dreaming of happiness together. You're dreaming of those together experiences. You're dreaming of family. You're dreaming of all kinds of relationships. 
not only promises and vows that are broken, but the hopes and dreams of the time of commitment which you have together. And so you're willing even to commit yourself and say, until death do us part. So the hope and dreams of a lifetime commitment are, are faded when one takes that step. Number five, remember also some of your happiest and most loving times together. I think that can be conducive to really thinking through what you're going to lose. If you begin to think, yes, you have a lot invested in those years together. And when I think particularly of what's called the 20-year fracture today, think of people who between 18, 20 years together, suddenly giving up at that point after they've invested so much in their relationship. That's extremely sad to me. Remember the times when you work through difficulties together and give you hope again for the new experiences uh, no matter how difficult they are and which are ahead. Number six, imagine what will happen to children if they're involved in a divorce. As I mentioned, it's not true that children get over it very suddenly. And so, as studies have been made over the last while, it may appear so many times that they take it pretty well. But studies on the long term say, no, it's not that simple. They too carry scars. Studies, I said earlier, drop out of school. Students, children from broken homes, much higher rate. Children carrying feelings of guilt. And if you read something along this line, you know that youngsters feel that some sense they're responsible also for the breakup how parents in divorce situations begin to get on kids' backs, you know, and kids develop those feelings of guilt which they carry on. Sense that somehow the essentials in life are missing because I don't have a mom or dad and they've given up on each other. Uh, I think of the long-term results and the relationships, I say, of graduations, of reunions of families, get-together, weddings, all of these. And uh, although many may argue that children are better off with a divorce than to live in an unhappy home, yet the fact remains that a child is more flexible many times where things aren't going exactly right than they are when things bust up. Um, I have found that uh, a child even can uh, work through bickering that goes on in a home and understand that over the long range uh, and, and weather that even better than simply the breakup of mother and father. Then to think of the effect or imagine what happens to families themselves on both sides. Both parents of those who break up because these also are deeply involved. And the happiness of these parents depends so much also, or uh, is affected so much by those who are breaking up. Now and in years to come, there will be waves of remorse that reach out to all persons that are related to that kind of experience. And as a young mother said to me just the other day, she said, divorce is intergenerational. <laughs> it's intergenerational. It affects all the generations that are living when you come down to it. And uh, also, uh, likely, the children of divorced persons are also likely to divorce. The pattern seems to be set unless somehow there can be a break in that pattern in a rather dramatic way. Then I say also, uh, imagine what will happen to the world around. Regardless whether we think it or not, divorce has its effect even upon the work situation. Divorce has its effect upon the church. Divorce has its effect upon the community. And even if we refuse to believe there is stigma there, 
I, I think the stigma still remains, even in a society that is a divorced nation such as ours. So what I try to do is picture as carefully as possible, as clearly as possible, some of those things that are bound to happen. And while it's easy from a legal standpoint, the impact emotionally is deeply disturbing with its side effects, depression, and uh, those things which follow. Feelings of failure. I think divorced people often have those feelings that I have failed, low self-esteem, which sometimes lasts a lifetime. Partners in many marriages who have considered separation and divorce, some have even taken the step of separation who have come back, returned to each other, and then work through their difficulties. Today have a more mature love and are able to face their problems together. The fact is that many divorced and remarried persons admit that it would have been easier to work through the first marriage than to move into an entire new relationship again. Friends of ours in Virginia, both of them divorced and now married to each other, say publicly to groups one after the other this very fact that they believe that although they are experiencing a good marriage together, yet the first marriage being rebuilt would have been easier than to start with an entirely new relationship together. The second area I'd like to talk about for a little while now is what I call running the red lights. Now, Charles Mylander wrote an article some years ago in which he entitled it Running the Yellow Lights. And that's where I got my idea to build on that a little. And I want to share it with you this afternoon using some of the illustration some of the points that Mylander himself used. I call them the red lights because I guess I'm inclined to take them even more seriously than yellow lights. Because all of them to me say stop. <laughs> Something's going on here that shouldn't happen. So let me go over these a little. Uh, I'm saying again that an adulterous affair or unfaithfulness does not happen all at once. There are steps that lead up to that moral failure. Uh, they go through predictable stages. There are warning signals along the line. And number one is emotional delight outside of marriage that is not taking place within marriage. That is, emotional affairs often precede physical ones. This is what I call the conversation stage. Here are two individuals. Perhaps they are working together at some place and uh, they begin the conversation stage because why? They're not doing much conversation at home. And so what seems very innocent and enjoyable, suddenly infidelity begins to develop. And uh, the principle is that infidelity begins, you see, when we begin to feel nothing is wrong, particularly which I'm doing. We enjoy the talking, and we begin to feel that we have a lot in common. And maybe all we have in common could be a great loneliness. That's number one. Number two, beware when we look forward to the next time of talking together or even now giving each other a little hug. This is what I call the touching stage. One was the conversation stage. Now it's the red light of the touching stage. You ignore it and you're headed for collision. That is, here when we think of that person, when we meet that person, you know, the heart jumps a little bit. We think of the other person when we're even off duty sometimes. And the principle is, Emotional infidelity precedes sexual infidelity. So that is that stage of the red lights. Number three, beware 
when you feel another meets your need. This leads to special times together now. You move beyond where maybe you were even doing things with another person you see outside the marriage. Sometimes even I've found this happening in a church committee. <laughs> can happen there. I can give you illustrations if I would want to, where in a church committee, certainly suddenly people felt jives together and it went beyond the bounds. Here is what I would call the possessive stage, where the principle is deceit and dishonesty always precede the stage of infidelity, where now we're sort of hiding, you see, a relationship which we have from our spouse. That is a real red flag. Number four, beware of undetected lust. Here is where now we develop a fantasy for another. We imagine perhaps even how happy we might be with this other person. And soaps today, it seems those illicit triangles on TV are that which feeds this kind of thing particularly for women, and pornography certainly feeds it for men. And so they feed that kind of lust, which should be easily detected, but we let it pass over very easily. There's a sense in which, with this kind of lust brewing within, we may kind of, a man may kind of undress every woman he sees coming down the street. The principle here is, that familiarity about happiness with another is a dangerous intersection. I've called it a red flag, a red light, which, if one does not stop, will lead to the destruction and death of the marriage itself. Number five is diminishing respect for your spouse. Now, this is a more subtle one, in a sense, that we begin to feel that a basic need is not met in my life. Maybe it's a sexual need that our spouse isn't meeting, or we don't feel we can communicate any longer, or we don't feel loved particularly at home, you see. One of these needs, it could be a multitude of them, aren't being met, and therefore there is really no hope for change. We don't see any hope for change. And uh, we get feelings, perhaps it isn't fair. You know, I'm caught. I'm uh, uh, caught in this relationship, she's cold, he can't talk, these kinds of expressions. And the principle here is that when there is losing respect for your spouse, the, the wise spouse will know it's time to take action. <laughs> Whenever we sense we're just losing respect for each other or feel that we're treated unjustly, then it's time to begin talking, to take some action, to get some help. Probably by that time, some help beyond ourselves. Number six, beware of feelings of lost love. Now, every marriage, I said, goes through those feelings at times, you know, where we feel loved some days and not loved maybe another day. Beware of that when we feel, have we goofed this bad? Would we be happier with someone else? The facts are clear, I say, that it's easier to repair the one you're in than to start over. If you write down that principle clearly, and I think people are saying that more today than they ever said it, it's easier to begin. The principle here is that disillusionment drives a person to another if you let yourself live with that disillusionment kind of thing. Then I'd like to mention, yet in closing, the four great enemies which uh, John Gottman in uh, a book, What Predictions, uh, What Predicts Divorce, he said in studies of thousands of marriages over the years, they have come to the conclusion in their research that there are about four things, if you look at them carefully, predict divorce. One, he says, is a complaining spirit. Always, when divorce is on the way, there is a complaining spirit toward each other. Now, we don't have time to enlarge on that one, but think of that a little bit. 
The second, he says, is contempt for the other person, where there's inner kind of contempt growing because of the deficiency which we feel the other has, because of the action, maybe the behavior, all kinds of things. Then the next, he said, is defensiveness. We become self-defensive. We defend ourselves for the way we're behaving because of what the other person is doing. And uh, I've counseled people like that. You know, They believe that they're justified in the way they feel and the way they're acting because the way the other person, it's a little like the drunk who said, you'd act the way I do too if you'd live with a woman like I'm living with, see? And so that defensive kind of spirit uh, is another one. Then the withdrawal. This is the fourth one that Gottman speaks about when he says these are always present in a marriage where you can say divorce is on the way. Well, after studying thousands of couples, uh, he says these four become the great uh, four horsemen of divorce. The principle here is, in contrast, the same things, you see, that built love in the first place are the things that are going to restore and build marriage no matter what step it is at. It's one of the reasons in the covenants of marriage, which I asked every young couple to work through when they uh, get counsel for marriage, the last one says this, we covenant together that if we run into problems that we ourselves cannot handle, we will seek help outside ourselves. That, I think, if followed through, could save also many a situation because so many marriages that have made it are marriages back in the early years of marriage that have, were ready to give up, ready to give up. Some have even left at that time their spouse. Today, they have gotten back into that kind of relationship, which is much better than they ever dreamed down here when they began. That is a great possibility also of marriage. Well, these have to do with uh, rather somber truths, rather sober kinds of things to think about, but I try to use them in helping persons to think about divorce, think about their life together.